Hello, aviation fans. Sky here, and it seems we have run out of single-aisle Boeing aircraft, as well as the three-engine and four-engine planes too. Yes, only two-engine wide-body airliners await, and the first one is already on our doorstep. Boeing 767, twin-engine wide-body airliner developed by Boeing in the early 1980s. Boeing's first project in this class. I already talked about it partially when I told about the 757, now it's time to take a closer look. Let's fly. On February 9, 1969, the brand new Boeing 747 made its maiden flight. Yes, now I'm starting all the stories from here. The plane became not just the largest aircraft in the world, but also the founder of a new class, Wide Body Airliners. This name was given to the planes with fuselages that were much wider than before, and cabins that are of course visually distinguished by the presence of two aisles. Therefore, these planes are also often called twin aisle airliners. Well, the Jumbo founded the class, but it wasn't on its own for long. The competitors quickly came to the market. McDonnell Douglas DC-10, Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, Airbus A300 and Illusion Il-86. All of them were smaller than the flagship of Boeing, but they were also showing very decent performance. Among them we have to mark one model, A300, the first plane of the newly baked European Airbus. The new plane was, let's just say, not perfect, but it had a feature that compensated all the problems. It was the only twin-engine airliner in the class. Due to this fact, it was not just more economical, but also cheaper to maintain. The aircraft engine is not an easiest device in the world. Therefore, despite the fact that the A300 was inferior to competitors in a number of important indicators, the aircraft was still very much in demand. The potential of twin-engine wide-body planes was obvious. Naturally, such a trump card could not have passed by the company from Seattle. Already in 1972, Boeing initiated a research program, the mission of which was to explore the possibility of creating a new wide-body twin-engine airliner. This program received the name 7X7. However, 7X7 had a problem. Boeing had spent so much resources on the 747 that there was almost no money left for new projects. Because of this, the company decided to cooperate with foreigners. New friends were found in Italian Air Italia, now a part of Elenia Aeronautica, and the Japanese conglomerate CTDC, Civil Transport Development Corporation. The new partners shared risks and partially financed the program. And in exchange, they were to become Boeing's major contractors in the production chain of future airliners. Initially, it was assumed that the Boeing 7X7 will be able to work with short runways and perform medium-range flights. However, customers did not support this concept. Airports were actively being modernized, and the possibility of working on short runways was no longer that critical. But the airlines wanted much more range. 7X7 had to be a long-range transport. By 1976, the 7X7 concept had been approved. The twin engine options were confirmed as basic versions, retaining the initial scheme very similar to the European model A300. It was the best way. The new engines were already quite effective, and the growing reliability gradually eliminated the fear of flying on a twin engine aircraft. In 1978, Boeing officially announced the expansion of the production site in Everett, where in addition to the 747 model, a new plane would be produced, which received the index 767. Three models were planned at once, 190-seat 767-100, 210-seat 767-200, as well as, surprisingly, the bigger three-engine 767 MRLR, accommodating 200 passengers and flying for long distances. At the same time, the 767 MRLR version was also proposed to be selected as a separate model, which should have been called Boeing 777, delivered to the market as a competitor to the Douglas and Lockheed planes. Project 767 was officially launched in 1978, when several major US airlines ordered the future plane. Model 100 was not in demand, its capacity was too close to Boeing 757, which turned out to be more preferable. At the same time, the concept of three-engine wide-body airliner was abandoned. 
The first customers were offered airliners with two optional engines. Pratt Whitney JT9D, already applied on Boeing 747, and General Electric CF-6, the civilian version of the TF-39 engines, created for the military transport Galaxy C-5. The wing of the aircraft was created in parallel with the wing of the Boeing 757 and used all the technologies obtained during the creation of the Boeing 747. Due to the improvement in design, it was possible to create a very aerodynamically effective wing. Boeing 767-200 was supposed to have a range of about 3800 miles and fly both transcontinental and transatlantic routes. The fuselage of the Boeing 767 was completely new. Narrow-body airplanes shouldn't even be considered here, they are… well, too narrow. But the width of the Boeing 747 fuselage for an aircraft of smaller dimensions was excessive. Aerodynamic resistance significantly worsened the performance. To improve flight characteristics, the fuselage received a width of just over 5 meters, the smallest option in the class. The width of the A300 fuselage was 5.64 meters, and the 747 fuselage reached 6.5 meters. On one hand, this of course improved aerodynamics, but the A300 fuselage is half a meter wider for a reason. It turned out that the 767 didn't have enough space for the standard LD3 cargo containers. The company had to develop smaller containers, now known as LD2. The same issue touched the cabin. It is more narrow than the analogs, although it still remains rather large and of course has two aisles. The cabin of economy class is most often equipped according to the layout of seven seats in a row, 2 plus 3 plus 2. And business class cabin is equipped according to the scheme of six seats in a row, 2 plus 2 plus 2. This was even better. Most of the passengers were located either next to the aisle or next to the window. There is only one inconvenient central row, and it is usually left empty, unless the plane is fully packed. Boeing 767 was the first wide-body aircraft originally created with a glass cockpit and manned by a two-man crew. The curious thing is, the airlines didn't support such innovations, so the company offered the cabin for three crew members as an option. This strange situation lasted for a couple of years, until a special government commission conducted a study and proved that two people are fully capable of controlling the plane. The similar situation happened to the Boeing 757, although there the basic equipment was designed for three pilots and the two-pilot scheme was offered as an option. Eventually, over the course of several years, the cockpits of both airliners, originally very close, were unified almost completely. Crews could easily switch from model to model with minimal retraining, although the pilots claimed that the heavier 767 was much more manageable, while the junior 757 turned out a bit less obedient. Boeing 767 became the first experience of the company in the wide international production cooperation. A complex communications and logistics network was created, which had to connect the company's main plants with suppliers, primarily from Japan and Italy. Wings and fuselages were made on the Boeing factories, the aerodynamic control elements produced by Italian Aerotalia. The slats were manufactured by the Boeing Vertol division. Japanese CTDC consolidated several manufacturers, Fuji Heavy Industries, Kawasaki Heavy Industries and Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. Huh, the Japanese are not particularly creative in their corporate names, are they? Actually, the legacy of this cooperation is still working. Many details for Dreamliners are being made in Japan. The Boeing 767-200 prototype with the original number N767BA, equipped with JT-90 engines, passed the rollout ceremony in late summer 1981. In September of that year, the aircraft made its maiden test flight. At that time, Boeing already had a portfolio of orders for 173 airliners from 17 operators. Six prototypes at once were participating in the test program. Four of them were equipped with GT-9D engines, other two with CF-6. Already by September 1982, airliners with both power plants were certified in the US and UK. After all the difficulties and delays with the Boeing 747, the introduction of a new model seemed incredibly smooth. The first operators loved the economy, the cabin comfort and the low noise levels. 
The demand for Boeing 767 grew even more when the international regulators expanded the ETOPS standards, allowing dual-engine planes to fly more routes over the Atlantic. These changes were implemented exactly thanks to the appearance of the Boeing 767 and Airbus A300, which proved to be highly reliable. High demand for airliners allowed Boeing to immediately announce the 767-200ER model with an increased flight range. The weight of the aircraft increased due to the increase of the amount of fuel, thus the range reached 6400 miles. Further development of the aircraft was an increase of capacity. In 1983, Boeing began the work on the model 767-300 with an extended fuselage as well as its version 300ER with increased range. Both aircraft could accommodate 350 people, and the ER model flew for a distance of up to 6,000 miles. This aircraft became very popular. Nearly 70% of all 767s were the 300 and 300ER models. Plans to increase the aircraft performance were not limited by the Dash 300 models. In the mid-1980s, there were ideas of creating an even longer aircraft, as well as the option with the second deck, which was nicknamed the Hunchback of Makoltio. The second deck was planned to be placed in the rear section of the plane. Makoltio is a small town not far from the Boeing plant in Everett. In the future, the 767-X project was launched, the aircraft with an enlarged wing and fuselage. But this project was cancelled in favor of the idea to create an entirely new airliner, the future Boeing 777. Being the second largest Boeing airliner, the 767 was very popular. Also, with the ability to fly over long distances, it remained fairly light for a wide-body aircraft allowing it to fly to regional airports, and airlines could reduce the number of transfers without using the overloaded hubs. In 1993, Boeing received the first orders for freighter versions. Deliveries of the cargo plane Boeing 767-300F began in 1995. At the same time, when the company was already engaged in the creation of the future Boeing 777, it refused to create its smaller version. Instead, it was decided to slightly increase the junior model's capacity. That way, the Boeing 767-400 appeared, first joining the Delta Airlines Park in 1997. By the beginning of the 21st century, the sky had seen more than 900 767 planes. However, deliveries began to decline. In 2001, Boeing stopped the work on the long-haul 767-400 ERX, in favor of the Sonic Cruiser project, which in terms of capacity was smaller. But the Sonic Cruiser was closed too, and the place of the company's main project was occupied by 7E7. The performance of the Project 7E7 was very impressive, and the airlines began to actively order it. By the time of the market entry, the brand new Boeing 787 Dreamliner already had orders for hundreds of units. However, the difficulties in development and production led to serious shifts in supply. As a result, the Boeing 767 remained in demand for some time. The aircraft still has a portfolio of orders for several dozens of cargo aircraft, as well as the KC-46 aerial tankers. At the end of 2016, there were 742 Boeing 767s of various modifications in operation, mainly by American and Japanese operators. And now, about the safety. By 2017, the Boeing 767 was involved in 45 aviation accidents, 16 of which resulted in serious hull damage. As a result of 6 air crashes and 3 hijackings, 851 people died. Again, the most serious disaster, just like with the 757s, was the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Two planes were captured by terrorists and attacked the towers of the World Trade Center in New York. As a result of this attack, 157 passengers and crew members of the aircraft and about 2,600 people were killed in the collapsed skyscrapers. Although the plane has an interesting story with a happy ending that actually showed its very good flight capabilities. In 1983, there was an incident with the Air Canada plane. In the middle of the flight, the plane suddenly ran out of fuel. Both engines stopped and the onboard systems were working at the minimum. Nevertheless, the liner didn't fall. Aerodynamics didn't fail. 
the plane managed to glide, losing only one and a half kilometers of altitude per every 20 kilometers of flight. Eventually, the aircraft landed on the runway of the close Canadian Air Force Base Gimli, earning the nickname Gimli Glider. One of the engines and the nose section were damaged, but not one of 69 people on board got hurt. Moreover, in just two days the plane was repaired and then it left on its own. After running out of fuel, engines failure and emergency landing on an abandoned airstrip. Now that is a success. Later, it turned out that due to a change of calculation methods, the aircraft was not fully refueled at the airport. Instead of the planned 16 tons, it only received 4. So I think such a success deserves a like. Fast flights and soft landings to you. And always make sure you have enough fuel in your tanks.